Welcome to the Movie Girl Society podcast brought to you by Neurotropolis. I'm your host, Sean Tajaport, the mayor of Neurotropolis. And joining me once again is my co-host, Drew Munhausen, the professional media and movie mastermind who has joined the latest MCU duo and has made it a trio with his existence. Yeah, I'm the newest of the Deadpools, right? Can I be a Deadpool? Hey, you could be whatever you want in the MCU, but I mean, you could be any type of variant you want to as well, or you just make your own new character and insert yourself into the MCU. So, so full disclosure, I'm like fresh out of the theater for Deadpool and Wolverine. Like Sean got to see this a few days ago. I literally drove home from the theater, sat down at my computer, and now we're recording. So I have... I, I just want to be clear. There's a lot of thoughts swirling around in my brain right now. So I'm going to be yeah, I'm going to hope to be as eloquent and thorough <laughs> going through these thoughts and not just having it be a random tangent of thoughts of like, oh, and this and then that and then this, because <laughs> this is a, e a movie that's very easy to do that with. Yes, but you're you just saw this. You literally saw it like seconds ago. So it's super fresh in your mind. I saw it a few days ago. So actually, I kind of wish I was in your shoes. Um, having that excitement just being done with it. But in this podcast, we explore the world of cinema from beloved classics to the latest blockbusters. And ladies and gentlemen, we have reached episode 50 milestone. And I cannot think of a better way to celebrate other than with Deadpool and Wolverine. This is exciting, Drew. This just happened by by chance, to be honest. Uh, we're going to do maybe a Twisters episode, but just due to timing and our own hurricane situation, our own uh, natural disasters, we couldn't do that, but we both saw Twisters. We loved it. My full review is on theirtropolis.com. But episode 50, which is actually, it's a, almost a year to this day, almost, that we started the first episode with Barbenheimer. Can you believe that? It's just weird timing. It kind of, it's coming together in a weird sense. I absolutely love it. That's already been a year. We're at episode 50 and we start with Bob Barbenheimer. Now we're doing Deadpool and Wolverine, which is going to be another big box office hit. Yeah, this movie's going to make mm, give or take a gajillion dollars somewhere in the realm of that, I'd say. Gajillion, bazillion, whatever you want to call it. All the MCU money is coming that way. But before we get into all of that, we want to make sure you can connect with us online. You can find me on almost every single social media platform at Sean Todge. Follow Nerdtropolis at Nerdtropolis and don't forget to visit Nerdtropolis.com for your daily dose of movie news, reviews, interviews, and trailers. And Drew, where can they find you where you're not contributing to Nerdtropolis? Yeah, you can find me at Drew Munhausen on all the different social media platforms. You can find me over at Letterboxd, logging what movies I'm watching, weekly over at Fresh Out the Podcast, and of course, every week at the Movie Goer Society. Also, don't forget to catch up on past episodes of the Movie Girl Society. Like I mentioned, episode 50, huge milestone for us. So big thank you to everyone that's been following our cinematic journey. It's been tons of fun. Uh, we got tons more coming your way. And don't forget to tune into my podcast, Real Insights, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and of course, the Metropolis YouTube channel. I got some good stuff coming your way, especially with Ninja Turtles. I talked to the voice cast of TMNT with their new one, Tales of the TMNT. Uh, some other stuff, too, if you're a never-ending story fan. Uh, the childlike empress I spoke to, she has a new film. She's back into acting and a lot of more stuff coming your way. I'm not going to announce them just yet. I need them fairly firmly. And oh, I will mention I'm talking to the Sandy Cheeks from SpongeBob SquarePants, who's having her own film on Netflix. So stay tuned for that. So tons coming your way. And also, you know, we, I get some fun emails here and there. You know, some people want to say, hey, do you want to check out this product or this product? I'm like, yeah, I just want to see if it's cool. I love it. I kind of. You know, I'm a big fan of Halloween, big fan of just nostalgia, just fun stuff from my childhood. I used to love stickers growing up. Uh, I know like there's a Marvel and Star Wars sticker book that I mentioned before, but I got this really cool, a creepy, cute sticker book. Uh, it is awesome. 500 stickers to scare you silly, uh, illustrated by Gaynor Curtis. And I'm telling you, if I can show this properly, some really fun stickers in this. I mean, there's some really fun stuff. Uh, whatever you like. Let me see where we go. Oh, look at there. I like this one right here. <laughs> I like the, the scary food. Uh, they're cute. They're fun. But the creepy cute sticker book uh, is available. And uh, I think it's fun for the whole family, especially uh, a little bit of everything. I mean, there is even, I got to show off some things right there. But I have children. Up. So yeah. stickers are a hot commodity when you have kids. I just love it. I'm just looking at all the pages. There's 500 plus stickers. It, this is a pretty thick book right here you can tell 
Uh, so definitely check out the creepy cute sticker book. I'll probably link up to it in the video. Uh, but I really appreciate them for sending me this and uh, anything else people want to send our way. We love it. We just love, you know, showing really cool stuff, regardless of what they are. Uh, Drew, I think this is like the movie everyone's been waiting for for the past two years. But real quick, you know, I want to show this off. A little Deadpool. Well, there we go. Here we go. Oh, my little Wolverine half. If you can see it. And for my co-host, I got a little matching best bubs necklace for us. Oh, if you can see that's it. so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> this is really hard to showcase, y'all. I'm really struggling here with the camera and showing this off. <laughs> oh, I got us matching necklaces. <laughs> Look at him make a heart. Does this mean we're going steady through through Moviegoer Society? We need to make Moviegoer Society a steady podcast. That's the goal. <laughs> so we got that. Uh, I went to Dave and Buster's and they had a claw machine there. Uh, I know like certain theaters, if you bought a ticket, you get like a coin to use it for their uh, claw machine and hopefully get something. Uh, but Dave and Buster's, I racked up like six prizes back to back to back with the claw machine. Uh, my inner Wolverine came out, mastered the claw system and grab myself a, a few things from there. Uh, so super excited uh, that I got to get some swag and wear this to the Deadpool screening that I had. Got to watch this in IMAX, Drew, and we're, we're going to start off right now. Real quick, spoilers, 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 spoilers. Drew, you got to say it five times two or something. Spoilers, 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 spoilers. Oh, and just an extra spoiler warning in case you didn't hear before. We're going full spoilers with this episode, everybody. We never do that, but we feel like with this one, we have to. There's too much to talk about. We're too excited. Um, so if you don't want to be spoiled for this, or maybe just come back and watch this after you do watch it and see what your thoughts are, go ahead and do that. Uh, but yeah, spoiler warning. First off, watch this in IMAX. Was amazing in IMAX. I loved it. Uh, I thought, I was just so excited to have Deadpool back. That's the first thing I'll say. Deadpool has been like MIA, obviously, since the whole Fox deal. And I was so excited to just have it back. On top of that, you have Hugh Jackman returning as the iconic Wolverine. That's a winning combination, Drew. I stayed away from trailers as much as possible. You know, that's my job to post them. I don't think I watched maybe the first one or so because it really didn't show much. After that, uh, I stayed away from everything. There's only one or two things that got spoiled to me, which was fine. One was. I'm going to say, I mean, we already said spoilers, so it doesn't matter. Sabretooth in this, in the trailer, and then X-23, which was in the trailers, which was fine. They spoiled X-23 because Daphne wanted to be at the premiere. That's why they spoiled that, because <laughs> they wanted, she wanted to be at the premiere, and that's why that happened. But this film, wow, Drew, what's your first reaction just walking out of theater without really getting into details? Like, what is your overall reaction coming out? I have a lot of mixed feelings so i'm positive i liked the movie to be clear like that's gonna be just a reaction like a sentence reaction before we dive into all those feelings it's a lot of fun it's it's not the the rescuer of the marvel cinematic universe that i think that it wanted to be or our fans wanted it to be in my opinion but i think it's a lot of fun if we're getting one mcu movie this year i think this is the one to have um it's it's a lot of fan service that I don't know if it's like a great movie, but there's a lot of fun stuff in it, if that makes sense. Yes, and I get your point, but I'm going to just correct you real quick. It does rescue the Marvel Cinematic Universe because it shows you what you can do when you play outside the sandbox of Disney and Marvel Studios. I mean, come on, Drew, it's a rated R film with all these superheroes. Uh, that's not It's not like the boys or anything like that. This is a family-friendly franchise in general that has really offered something just like Netflix did with Punisher and Daredevil. When you say franchise, you mean the MCU? The MCU, yes. And mm -hmm. superhero, the, the genre itself, you know, it's not like DC's the Joker and stuff they do with that stuff. This is something so different. I think this formula they created uh, was just brilliant. And they went all in, didn't hold back with the rated R rating, uh, especially the the first sequence. I mean, you, you know what's funny about that though? Like when I was leaving the theater, I I heard a young man leaving in front of me say to one of his friends, like, wasn't rated R enough for me. And I'm sitting there thinking like, what more do you want? There's so much violence in this. There's so many like 
sex jokes and vulgarity like pretty much the only thing there wasn't was just full out nudity so i'm like what, like, what more did you want that's the this? one thing that feige was not gonna allow he allowed a lot of cocaine jokes you know uh when they made a little fun of feige and stuff like that. and feige and uh to mention feige got his star on the hollywood walk of fame well deserved what a genius he is uh ryan reynolds came to him many times to deliver a third deadpool film and was very adamant about not really kind of doing it, not bringing back Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. Uh, they took a lot of thought with Sean Levy and everyone else to create something that wasn't going to, like I said, wasn't going to ruin Logan. And so let's talk about that. The opening sequence is Logan, and it does not bring back that Wolverine. So let's talk about that. What do you think about that opening sequence pretty much is what it is. It's like the, the opening credits. And uh, I won't go too much in detail because I know we're doing spoilers, but I don't want to just go through every single step of it. But it's right. pretty much Deadpool going after Logan, digging him up and realizing he's truly dead. He does not come back. He does not regenerate anything. He is done. Dunzo. TVA is the plot of the film pretty much uh, coming to prevent all the stuff that Deadpool's going into. And he has an awesome battle with the TVA using every bone and that's existing because the adamantium in there with Wolverine. Uh, what a scene that was. I think that set the tone of what to expect violence wise. And the action throughout the stuff that Deadpool was doing and Wolverine once Wolverine's in the fray, the action's consistently really good. Like considering you've got, you know, fist knives, you know, for Wolverine and you've got you know, Deadpool with katanas. He's got guns too, but I feel like, I mean, he used his guns, but there's just a lot more sword play and stabbing in this he likes movie. Having there's a lot of stabbing. When he fights. He, shooting is to get things done quickly, but he likes to have fun. He likes, he likes fighting, it feels like. He likes the battles. He likes the dance, the song and dance. He loves it. And the stabbing doesn't ever get old. Like you don't get desensitized to it at all. Like even at the end of the movie, when people are getting stabbed in places where they don't want to get stabbed, it looks painful. It looks like it hurts. So when you saw the opening credits, would you what do you think? Did you see like this sets this the, the tone? Really, I mean that's a lot of CGI in that in that set, but in general, the whole film does not feel CG heavy. I was actually really surprised how practical almost everything looked to some extent. Yeah, and they and they had some practical sets here, which came at the risk of of leaks, which there were leaks early on. But, you know, it's kind of worth it. I, you mentioned Daphne Keene wanting to be at the premiere. Like I kind of kind of backtracking a little bit, like going into this movie. What, what did I expect? I approached it the same way as you. Right. Like I watched the Super Bowl teaser and I watched, I think, the first real trailer, which I wouldn't have been able to avoid it anyways, because I go to the movies enough that that trailer played all the time. But whenever there were more vignettes or trailers released, least after that, I was skipping all of those. I saw some things over the past week um, on social media about like Lady Deadpool and um, Daphne Keene. And I had seen the leaks over a year plus ago. Um, the, um, one leak that is welcome. And, the one leak that's welcomed is Dogpool. That was not was technically yeah. not a leak, but that was one leak that I actually loved that they said Dogpool and who melted our hearts. Let's say that, right? Dogpool melted our hearts in this film. But I just I went into it knowing obviously there's going to be a lot of cameos. They're going to be doing a lot of jokes and breaking the fourth wall and all the things you expect from Deadpool. But of course, Deadpool coming into the MCU and kind of the the death, quote unquote, of of the Fox universe. I'm assuming there's going to be a lot of like kind of tongue and tongue in cheek jokes. And of course, there were. Um, but I didn't know. I just knew that nothing's off the table. Right. Like we saw the Flash last year which had the whole nick cage superman scene in it and was that last year or the year before i can't even remember i when think that was the last flash year came but out. before we get I, and i get that but like the flash i can't really compare it with its cameos the cameos were a little different and before we get into the cameos for deadpool and wolverine i will say this uh we won't go into the, the plot too much because we're more excited about the cameos and that's probably what the focus here would be but after that scene you know with that that Wolverine being kind of gone and like he has to find the right Wolverine. He goes through this mission, a little short mission, too short for me, to be honest. But the fact that Deadpool is jumping around trying to find a Wolverine to put in place in his own world uh, was just what a montage that was. 
Uh, this kind of <laughs> gave you everything that you haven't seen yet in the past X-Men movies. Like if you wanted to see different interpretation of Wolverine, like this was the way to, the way to kind of get it in a, in a montage. There are so many versions of Wolverine. Um, I think one of my favorite ones I will mention is the most comic book accurate Wolverine <laughs> that everyone was complaining about. Hugh Jackman being too tall to play Wolverine. And what they did is make a Oompa Loompa version of Hugh Jackman as Wolverine as everyone was complaining like, oh, he's not thick enough. He's not wide. He's not short. He's not the comic book accurate. I thought that was hilarious. I don't know whose decision that was, but that was one of the most brilliant things to come from that montage. Well, and it's and this is the type of thing that makes it clear that like just because you're a comic book fan and you've read a lot of comics doesn't mean you know how to make a good movie because this got one of the biggest laughs in my theater uh, and being in a full theater was the small Wolverine. And it's like if you had small Wolverine in a movie, this is how it would be. And I don't know if it would work. Hugh Jackman as Wolverine in all the films he was in. It worked. This this was it was very funny. This movie really showed how Hugh Jackman, you know, some actors are just made for a role, but no one really expected Hugh Jackman to be the one and only Wolverine for us. I love his Wolverine. I think he's perfect, but I always thought we would get a different version as quickly as possible whenever his time came, but apparently not. And this movie has established him as irreplaceable as Wolverine, which is a good and bad thing. It, it It's kind of, um, it's kind of tough to find out who would be the next Wolverine, but there was one cameo. We'll talk about this. We're going to probably go out of order of cameos. One Wolverine cameo. I was like, that works, but they're not going to do it. Just like John Krasinski as Mr. Fantastic in um, Dr. Strange and the, what is it? What is it called? Um, Multiverse of Madness. Multiverse of Madness, where we got him as Mr. Fantastic. We got probably the most next level replacement for Hugh Jackman. And it was Henry Cavill. Just wow how he looked the part. That's the first thing, especially in the white tank top with the motorcycle working on tinkering. The look itself and the build worked. To the point where it took me a minute. Like, I didn't immediately recognize him. I'm like, who am I looking at? And it wasn't until Deadpool calls him Cavalrine. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that was Henry Cavill. Because to your point, he's in like it's it's not like they focus on the fact that it's Henry Cavill. I mean, he's in the full you think it's Hugh Jackman. Makeup. You just think it's yeah. another Hugh Jackman you're showing. And then he speaks. And I was like, no, give us that. But you, I knew from the get-go that was the only time where you get Henry Cavill as Wolverine. Maybe I'm wrong. Knock on some wood. Maybe I'm wrong and that was a tease, but I doubt it. That's not his role in the MCU if that happens. But such fan service there, I could totally see it. And it kind of makes me a little mad that we're not going to get it just like well, John Krasinski as Mr. Fantastic. And this is the only, this is why I mentioned the flash earlier. And I understand like what you were saying, because no, I would not compare the two as movies, but all I was saying is that the flash established that cameos in movies or fan service cannot just be existing characters as we've seen them. It could be rumors. It could be fan service. It could be fulfilling movies that were announced, but never were. Um, which we'll get into in a little bit too, but like, that's what I mean there. So I just, I knew going into this, that nothing was really off the table. And so th this Henry Cavill appearance was a, uh, is, is a perfect example of that because I didn't see it coming. It's total fan service. It's a fan casting. It's, you know, all these things, rumors and whatnot, but you're right. Like this is it. This, I, I don't think we see any more of this. What a, what a great idea, first of all. And the fact that Henry said yes, Feige was okay with it for whatever. Re I mean, it's just interesting to me. Hopefully he does make the jump in the MCU. It's, it's kind of tough to see what he would do, but it, it, it works. It was amazing. I loved it. I don't want, I'm going to go back a little bit, but I think the first cameo that really, or it's not really a cameo, it's part of the plot that uh, Deadpool jumps into Earth 616 the main MCU world and is trying to join the Avengers. And we have John Favreau as happy Hogan, which I did not see coming. And the time period that it's in is when obviously, um, I don't know what time you can give it, but it definitely, uh, Tony Stark's still alive. And it's, it's in 2018. So it's pre, right, right. it's pre in game. Yeah. So that was kind of like the start of the cameos coming in and so forth. And, uh, what, Deadpool lives in what was it 1005 
Earth 1005, I believe. Yeah, something like that. It was many digits. It was more digits than 616. <laughs> uh, so that's the birth of that. And obviously he's going and trying to find his ideal Wolverine. And um, talk about, let's talk about the Wolverines. There's a few others that pop up. There's a oh, go ahead. You go ahead before well, just, I jump in. I, I was just going to say with this, I think I was surprised and Obviously, they kind of have to do this because of bringing in Deadpool from the Fox universe and everything. I was after the big opening action scene that was very fun. I was kind of surprised at how much this movie had to slow down and do a lot of exposition, which they joke about. Like he makes jokes about how much exposition they're having to do to set all this up. But like, I mean, there really was a lot. I was like, OK, like, let's get to Hugh Jackman. Let's get to it. Like you have to go through all the TVA. No, no shade to Matthew McFadden, who I, I love. If you're, you know, any of my succession fans, you know, shout out to all of you and, and Tom Wamsgam fans. Um because he's he was very funny in this, but, uh, th you know, it's all exposition for a bit there in the well, TVA. They used it pretty well. I mean, for that character, it's a TVA. The TVA is huge. And I kind of like them explaining how the TVA works even further. I feel like it's things we didn't see in Loki. There's the TVA is going to be a bigger thing going forward. So back to all the Wolverines. There was a couple. There's the eye patch Wolverine and a few others. Um, I guess I'll mention this, too, while we're at it. We do get the Hulk in this fighting Wolverine for a brief second. And he has the iconic brown suit. And that was probably one of the best fan services that I saw as well. Uh, what other Wolverines stuck out to you? There's the, the Wolverine essentially being like crucified on the large X. That's like a classic, uh, a classic cover. Um, and there's the other one where he's in like the red and black suit and he's got the really long mangy hair too. I like that look a lot. Is that like ultimate or something like that? Like ultimate X-Men maybe, or the future. I don't, I remember that look, but I don't remember where it's from. Yeah. Something like that. I'm, I'm not even sure. Patch. You mentioned patch, uh, which I believe he's just called patch in the comics. Yeah. I'm, I'm honestly not the best on all the Wolverine lore. I know enough X-Men and X-Men covers to be like, Oh yeah, that's an iconic look. But like, I couldn't tell you, I couldn't place all of them. But that look, I really did like a lot, actually the the long hair and the, the future and stuff like that. Really cool. And obviously we get to the Wolverine that we see with the iconic suit that everyone was waiting for. And there's, obviously a reason behind why he wears it, but that's the finally, that's the earth he has to go to to find the Wolverine that's wearing that very more comic book accurate suit, which is great. So it all kind of does make sense at the end because everyone was asking, how are they going to bring Hugh Jackman back? How are they going to bring that suit back? Because I was expecting them to build a new suit like they did for Deadpool and offer that to Hugh. I didn't know what version of Wolverine we're going to get. Um, I and had the a short answer is that it's not the, the Wolverine from the X-Men movies that we've seen. It's a yeah, different the one that you saw Logan. Yeah. As you see in the, the, the beginning credits. So I actually went into this film thinking of a whole different story in my head than what was delivered, which is always a great thing. Uh, not being that where I was misled. I just thought, you know, I, I stay away from it as much as possible and didn't try to put anything together. But I was like, if they're going to do this and Loki's tied to the TV, maybe Loki has, is going to appear in some way. He does not appear. Uh, but which is okay. It kind of made sense where they're doing this. And to be honest, this movie is pushes the MCU a little forward. And, you know, I do think it has, it does some not damage, but it does offer a lot of value to where the MCU is heading and how much fun they can have. This is really a farewell to Fox studios. And I did not see that coming where this was like almost a love letter and really almost 110% focus on Fox Studios in general. Like it was almost like a Fox film stabbing itself in the heart and, and delivering something. It didn't feel like a Marvel Studios film, a Disney film or anything like that. Um, they really swallowed it, the whole Fox thing inside and they delivered. And it kind of swerves you for a second because you're kind of trying to figure out like I've seen the pictures of, of you know, Deadpool with the big crashed Fox sign. Like I've seen these kinds of things. I'm like, how are we going to get there? And when they're doing all the exposition, explaining the timeline and losing the anchor character, which I actually liked all that explanation. Like I thought that was a pretty good way to put it with the Fox universe and, and the importance of Hugh Jackman to it. I was like, this is like pretty meta, but this is well done. Um, but when they were explaining like, oh, we want you to go and basically put everybody out of their misery in the in the Fox universe. They don't use those words, but in, in that universe. And then, you know, you can come to the MCU. And I was like, oh, OK, that makes sense. This really 
really is going to be like a Marvel kills or D- Deadpool kills the Marvel universe, but specifically the Fox universe. And that's what I thought they were setting up for. And then they swerve because he gets then, you know, essentially sent to the wasteland instead. So, um, so good, I actually good, like good, some good of that place setup. and good place to continue is to the wasteland. You get into that. It's really cool. Uh, no secret. It's like Mad Max. They talk about Mad Max. They talk about Furiosa. They have the same type of Mad Max uh, entourage of cars and all this stuff. And then Mad I Max see- mentioned by name and yes, Furiosa, and Furiosa too. Furiosa. Like they make they make those jokes. I mean, God bless Marvel Studios to get away with certain things and they do their due diligence and stuff. So that makes the film more fun. And you know, I'm watching this caravan come, and it's led by um, it's led by um. Sabretooth, who was Tyler Main, the original Sabretooth, which I obviously love that version of Sabretooth. Um, Shreve, what's what's Schreiber? What's Schreiber's first name? The other Leave Schreiber. Schreiber. Yeah, uh, I like his Sabretooth a lot, but really for me, Tyler Main's Sabretooth is iconic to me. Who else was leading that caravan? Um, it was Aaron Stanford as Pyro is really kind of leading it, and then yes. you immediately see Sabretooth and Toad also as part of this. Uh, as part of this grouping. So, uh, and I don't remember the timeline person. You saw it's more fresh in your head, but as they're approaching, there's another person that's there. There, that's there is. In the sh- <laughs> and uh, he's covered up a little bit, but it ends up being Chris Evans. And you're just like, what? Okay. how much money do they have? First of all, it's a question. Did you know, though, like I immediately was like, oh, I know where this is going to be. I Yes. I figured out before anybody else, because I don't think people were paying attention to some of the details on him, but in general, here's Chris Evans. And he's like really trying to be, he does say at some point, almost like watch your language to some extent. Right. He has some type of line about what, what Deadpool's saying, I guess, or like, that's not what we say here or something like that. Uh, so it kind of misleads you. But if you look closely at his fabric that he's wearing, he is wearing blue and red, which was weird. The red was to be throwing off people. You look at the fabric. I'm like, that is not Captain America at all. But, well, but Deadpool thinks it's Captain America. Yes. Like that's, he makes many comments because they're trying Captain to America swerve you. It's also like the pride and joy of Deadpool. Like Deadpool wants to be like the next captain or his buddy or something. He really respects captain America so much as well. And so he was super excited. Captain America. And then we realized it's not captain America at all. It is Johnny store from fantastic four from the Fox air, obviously. And I was like, this is genius. And then I was like, I still didn't know where the movie was going or what the point was of the movie having these random X-Men characters having Johnny Storm in here. And uh, I actually was very happy to see him back. And it's weird because I, I still see him as Johnny Storm when he's playing Johnny Storm. And kind of miss, I kind of missed that era because he was really, a really good Johnny Storm, to be honest. Yeah, I, I always like Chris Evans to me when you're a young high school kid who's into comic books and they're making fantastic four movies that, you know, the big question is who's going to be the human torch. And Chris Evans was cast as that. And I always kind of had an eye on him when he was in those early roles doing like not another teen movie and push and these kind of like when he was trying to kind of make a name for himself and it, and it, it, to 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 not as much success he did the fantastic four movies which i think kind of got him a little bit more on the map but those movies were varying quality and then you know until he got cap that's that's when he really became a name but i mean i always have a little bit of nostalgia for him in this role in particular so it was nice for him to have some fun with it and say goodbye to it and i think it's just nice that chris evans has enough fame now and has had enough success that he can look back at these early parts and make fun of himself and you know i respect it the fact that he's willing to come back as johnny storm because you know he said i had to come back as captain america for a reason but it's like he could technically come back as johnny storm and he did which was great and so uh really appreciate chris for coming back for that you know they get captured by tyler main and to- uh, saber tooth and toad they head back to in the trailer. You see that giant ant man, uh, giant man, ant man body. That's the compound that they're being taken back to uh, where Cassandra Nova, which is Professor X's twin sister, played by Emma Corrin, who really does a great job, to be honest. She has a lot of scenes to me, not enough scenes. I would like to see more because she really does offer a really great. I don't think we've never seen that character before. I don't think Legion had that. I don't think Legion had her character in it i don't believe so uh so i think this is the first time seeing cassandra nova in live action so uh i thought emma corn was brilliant what do you think about 
seeing Cassandra Nova for the first time. This is the part of part of the movie that I was just I like I didn't care. Like I, I like Cassandra Nova. It, it is. I've read comics with her. I've never been a big villain for me seeing her realize in the movies. Like I thought Emma Corrin was fine. It just like it's such a little like, well, we got to have a villain in here somewhere. Like we have to have some opposition amongst all the chaos. Like let's do Cassandra Nova. It, this is the part of the that just didn't do much for me. Well, while she's there. There's other X-Men characters and not really technically the same actors for all of them. They're like, which which is actually it works. And to be honest, I would have been okay. I don't know who those actors were playing some of those iconic characters, but like I was okay accepting like some no-namers or unfamiliar faces playing that character. I'll start off with Juggernaut was the first one. Uh, was it what ver was that a version of Juggernaut that we've ever gotten with that actor, or they just didn't get? No, because um, Vinny Vinny Jones Vinny plays the part in X Men: The Last Stand. I think it's the third X Men that has that Juggernaut. It's the same costume as that one in this, but it's not Vinny Jones. So yeah, there's it, they had Psylocke was here, um, but it wasn't Olivia Munn. It was a different actress. Uh, they had Lady Deathstrike was here, and I'm not sure if it was the same actress or not. Um, Wikipedia is saying it was, but to me it looked. Different different but i i don't know um who else there was at least one other that okay, i'm forgetting as, now as as uh as oh Isabel? yes 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 that was the other one who yeah, callisto and i think arc light um and then like i don't know when this pulled up but there was a bullseye from daredevil i never saw bullseye i saw i saw that listed in on wikipedia i was like i never saw bullseye and then I said the Russian from um, Punisher. That was the big guy with the red and white striped shirt, yeah. which was Kevin Nash in the uh, in the old one. But yeah, I, they had they had characters. I was like, I'm pretty sure that's who that's supposed to be. So actually, this is a good point for a tangent. Um, you had tasked me before seeing this movie if I could do my best to keep a count of how many cameos there were in this movie total. And at the end of the day, I counted about 20 um, when I was like marking tallies through the movie, but some of those have asterisks to your point. Cause like, these are characters I'm like, well, like the characters here, but it's not always the same actor. Does that count as a cameo? It does if, like count. it's juggernaut. I, it does count. And I'll tell you that because I wasn't expecting them to get every actor to get back. The funny thing is I was surprised how much Chris Evans was Johnny storm until they finally killed him off. And it made sense in a gruesome, gruesome, gruesome way. Probably the most gruesome kills I've ever seen. And I was like, when are they going to kill him? They can't, he's paycheck. Like, he has a standard. Like, you cannot pay Chris Evans any less. He cannot take any less for his own sake. And, uh, yeah, they finally killed him off. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. And now we can continue on to some of the fake the fake <laughs> X-Men characters. I say fake as in it's not the actual actors and so forth. And so I was like, well are there any other surprises we're going to get? Because that was a really big one. And, you know, yeah, it's cool. We got, you know, some other ones and we know X 23 is going to show up at some point. Uh, and I didn't know where the story is going to go. I, I was in it. what do you think of the, the journey so far leading up to Cassa being introduced to Cassandra Nova? Are you still all in with the story and kind of the journey they're leading us on and the fun surprises and like, just, the interesting I, this is where we're talking about how for me the movie had peaks and valleys right like the opening was a peak and then we had kind of a valley when they're doing a lot of exposition and then is, when they got to the wasteland it peaked again and in introducing johnny storm and all these characters and then you get to the the cassandra nova part and then it kind of dipped again for just a little bit um but i think we're getting to a, a point here soon where it peaked again for me until that big little spike that we're going to talk about I just love the dynamic again with Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman. There's so much buddy cop moment, so much fighting against them, so much back and forth and just commentary between the both of them. It really made this such an awesome movie. Like what a movie that was just because to see them on screen, you could have, I would have paid a ticket price just to see them talk about their gin. And what's the other, what's the drink that Hugh Jackman has? One's aviation gym for Ryan. What's what is Hugh Jackman has some type of beverage that they partner up with alcohol, or whatever. I think it's in the movie, but I can see him talk about their own business and their brands. Like I can just sit there in a chair and just watch them like for two hours, talk about nothing. That's how I don't good know. Like half of them have vineyards and have different things. I don't <laughs> yeah. even know what Hugh Jackman's alcohol is. But, I, but the two of them, I can see them just talk to each other and I'd buy a ticket just to watch it. Like it didn't have to be Deadpool and Wolverine. That's how talented and charismatic and how much chemistry they have together. And majority of this film is them two together from 
coming across Dogpool and the Highlander version of like Deadpool, uh, which is really awesome, to that uh, Honda Odyssey road trip across uh, the dunes and into the forest. And that's where it leads up to some awesome. But there's a big fight in that Honda Odyssey. I was going to mention the Honda Odyssey fight scene was was very good. <laughs> what, like. That was a very long scene. And in the movie, it's a very long scene because it ends up being like, what, the next night or something or next day? Like they're literally <laughs> fighting in this Odyssey for like 24 hours straight. <laughs> it, it, it is totally wild. Uh, but before, where they, before we head to where they go, backtrack a little bit. What do you feel, feel about Highlander, Deadpool, and then Dogpool and him falling in love with Dogpool and not wanting to give him back pretty much <laughs> to this Highlander? Uh, this version. was fine uh dog pool i liked the the highlander deadpool as you're referring to it i thought was okay it's like this was kind of the most that ryan reynolds gets to like poke fun at himself in the movie and not like 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 himself as an actor and like being a good looking guy and this kind of stuff like i appreciated all that um i don't know if all the humor of this character worked on me as much but you know i i, I don't hate it for me, when I was watching, did you think that was him, his face CGI'd on someone else? Because it would look like that a lot of the times. Or am I just making oh, that up no, in my I head? Oh, no, I didn't think that, but maybe. I was just thinking that. Maybe they just made him too good looking in that. And so that's why I'm like questioning. They made him like too Fabio-like, obviously. And so I wasn't sure if that was like they just implanted his face because there's a lot of discussion between the two of them. So I don't know if just to make it easier, just CGI his face on it, you know, and not have to do two takes for that conversation. But yeah, you have them in that Honda Odyssey, they go in the forest and then all of a sudden they're falling asleep and then someone takes the car and they go into this like bunker in the woods. Uh, man, I what, what a scene that becomes when they wake up from this bunker. I think, um, Wolverine's drinking. He finds some Jim Bean finally. He needs some alcohol. And um, yeah, then they have this awesome. I'll let you take this away because I'm still in awe of what happened. Well, I knew I had seen the announcement a long time ago that Jennifer Garner as Electra was supposedly appearing in this. So yes, we covered that, too. I, I definitely I think I made the point at some point that that was going to happen. That was a very strong possibility. So that was one we we're expecting. I didn't know when. So th that yep. was the first person, I believe, to walk out. So I was like, OK, cool. This is the Electra scene. And then another character walks out. And this is the one that made me almost spit out my drink because I this is the most excited I got. I got for any of the cameos in this movie for me personally. When Wesley Snipes as Blade walked out, I was I mean, my jaw dropped. I was in shock and I was I, I actually said out loud uh expletives that i won't repeat on this on this show but i mean it takes a lot to shock me that one got me i can't more so I can't. than the one that came directly after the blade That's shocked very true. me more very true what shot we won't get to that third one just yet but that one shocked me. yeah seeing wesley snipes come out full-blown blade an older blade and i'm curious of which variant he is because i don't to me that was not the blade from the original films to me in my eyes i feel like there was a, a little bit of a difference not just visually with his appearance but i think some of his uh personality and attitude was a little different than the blade we're used to so this is a variant from somewhere else uh but backtrack a little bit i was like super excited to see Electra back like awesome that she was still up for the fact that these people are up to returning to a character to play when they're much younger and to put on the spandex still and still wanting to do it you know that just shows them how much you know they love playing this in this genre and they love their characters and the opportunity so really cool to see jennifer garner back as electro same outfit looking really badass still you know, and um, those are the good old Fox days, which started with Wesley Snipes' Blade, which is really the success of the MCU that started on. It's like a really small seed, right, of the early days of Marvel. And that was great to see. And uh, yeah, let's all we'll talk about the third one, which I think is my favorite cameo, to be honest. Even though there's mind blowing cameos, we have Gambit shows up. There was a Gambit, everybody. Can you believe that? Gambit. Well, not just any game, not a game that we saw before. Uh, a very comic book accurate gambit visually. You, and <laughs> like, you see the, the card first. You yes. see the card first that's glowing purple. And I'm freaking out because I grew up loving Wolverine, Cyclops, 
loving Gambit, and obviously Beast by Gambit was so is such a cool character. In the video games, I would try to play him as often as I could because I love the glowing cards. So yes, that's the first thing you see, and then oh, that's well, all. That's, you, that's your cue. That's your cue. You, you you see the card, and in my head, I'm going, "Well, it's one of two, and I don't think it's going to be Taylor Kish, you know, of Friday Night Lights fame, who played Gambit in Wolverine Origins." I'm like, if this is Channing Tatum, I'm going to be pretty pumped. And sure enough, Channing Tatum walks out in complete comic accurate Gambit gear doing a relatively terrible, <laughs> but but almost purposely so, um, Cajun accent. And uh, this this was this was really good. You know, I. I didn't say this to anybody, but I was thinking about this before the movie. So the David Leach of it all, right? The director, David Leach, who directed most recently The Fall Guy, also directed Deadpool 2, um, but all, and then directed Hobbs and Shaw and Bullet Train um, between Deadpool 2 and The Fall Guy. And there was this period of time between like 2018 and 2022 where all these people were showing up in each other's movies, right? Like David Leach worked as a stuntman for years for Brad Pitt famously, right? Well, Brad Pitt has a super small role in Deadpool 2 and appears there. Well, then... Um, then David Leach directed Hobbs and Shaw, right? Well, Ryan Reynolds appears in that. And then Ryan Reynolds and Channing Tatum appear in Bullet Train because Channing Tatum had been with Brad Pitt in whatever that movie's called with Sandra Bullock. The, 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 well, uh, I anyway, I know this is a long <laughs> tangent, but I'm just saying there's a point in time where like Ryan Reynolds, Channing Tatum, Brad Pitt, and all these people were like intertwined with each other and showing up in each other's movies all the time. So I thought going into this, I'm like, there is probably a solid chance of Channing Tatum showing up as Gambit in this movie, but I didn't really expect it to happen. And so when it happened, I mean, I was shocked. And not only that it, that it happened, but like, it's a pretty significant part in the movie. Like, it's not like it's a one and done. He has well, no, multiple and all, scenes. And all of them are have significant parts. But I'll tell you, like, I don't, I know they have that relationship with Brad Pitt and Channing and all of them, but I don't, obviously we got to say there was a Gambit movie that Channing Tatum was writing and wanted to make and they, they, they cut it. They, it really was going to happen and they stopped it. And I'm kind of glad they did stop it because regardless of the comic book accurate, you know, costume, his, I just see Channing Tatum. He is too big of a star too too his face is too known for him to really truly be gambit who's not really a main character right and in, in the in the x-men team he's too big of a name too noticeable face and then so it's kind of becomes comical with this especially with his accent and all i can think is my name is jiff you know because he's doing this like this regular <laughs> like asian accent in a weird way that's like just uh, I'm going to say like molesting the accent pretty much and doing some weird intertwang thing and really pushing it where all the jokes are like from Deadpool are like, what the hell are you saying? Cause it all sounds like gibberish to everybody and including us. And I'm glad Shannon Tatum really, when he leads into the comedic stuff, he really can do it. You know, uh, I like to see Shannon Tatum in comedies cause I think he's actually authentically really, really funny. And so seeing him and Ryan Reynolds kind of play off each other a little bit is great. And a lot of the lines that Gambit says is pretty ridiculous when you do understand what they're saying. And yeah, he does definitely has uh, a lot of scenes. And then we talk about the fourth person that comes in, which is the ones we saw in the trailer, uh, Daphne as X-23, and um, which was great. I'm glad, like after seeing her in uh, the Acolyte, who, which I thought like she needed a better role than the acolyte because she proved herself they should not have gotten rid of her. Um, they, they, they obviously kill her. I'm gonna <laughs> spoilers anyways for any show, any movie we're talking about. But yeah, yeah, I early that, on in that show. I, yeah, I, I, I was really disappointed. I said, why would you do that? One of your probably top, top actors and favorite characters, um, would love to have seen her continue in Star Wars. That didn't happen, but she's here back as X twenty three. And I'm really curious of like which one, sh which where she's from, because it always feels like they po pulled her from the Logan movie. But I don't think there's no way it's from the Logan movie. I, I I feel like I don't know what world she's from or which variant of X-23 she is, but it's almost identical to Logan. But there's no way that she would be end up there if she was in that universe. Yeah, they so, don't ever really even try to explain it. Like she's just there and it seems like she has the the you know the ties to to logan and everything that she had 
before. Yeah, the story, the, the the speeches she gave, the sunglasses and everything like that was all Logan, but there's no way she can be from that. I feel like they would also, that would taint Logan as well, the film itself. So I feel like they, an adjacent Earth that's very similar maybe to that film that had a couple differences is probably my my best bet on that. Um, so they kind of build their own X-Men, I feel like, uh, after that, <laughs> all those introductions. Uh, that that core four there that we just talked about, plus Deadpool and Wolverine uh, going back to uh, Cassandra Nova and trying to figure out how to be sent back home. Everyone wants to go back home, apparently, it seems like. And uh, then you have um, a big battle when they go there. Oh, there's one thing I didn't mention, but I love seeing that Fantastic Four vehicle. I think I, I forgot to mention that. But that Fantastic Four. Oh, yeah, that's Four, right. It's, yeah, I noticed it too. That was good. In the beginning. So uh, backtracking a lot, but there's that iconic Fantastic Four, like retro, really cool, like hover car, which is there. Uh, but they go back to battle so they can kind of figure out a way to get to their worlds. And what what a fight sequences. Everyone gets to shine, I feel like, in this battle sequence um, from Electra to Blade to Extra. They to, honestly, Gambit, Shannon Tannen's Gambit has some of the best fights in the scene. And this really shows you how Gambit would look great, obviously, live action. And we should not wait long to have a Gambit or any of the X-Men, to be honest, in the, in the main uh, MCU. And, you know, Ryan Reynolds, your your close personal friend now, um, Ryan Reynolds. Oh, that's right. He a, did. He did retweet my uh, reaction to the film. I totally forgot about that. Yes, we are close friends now. We're best bubs. Yeah, he's been posting a lot, obviously, in the lead up to this movie. He's always been very active on social media, but you can tell even he is like just very nostalgic for the journey that he's been on and and he has a lot of reverence for it all and he posted I, I was trying to find it actually while we were while you we were chatting a minute ago but i couldn't find it but i saw it a, a few days ago he posted some things from a comic con san diego comic con a few years ago probably a decade ago now and the panel it was for for fox at comic con and the panel the movies that they were promoting were the Fantastic Four movie that came out with Miles Teller and um, Michael B. Jordan, so on and so forth. Deadpool, um, X-Men Apocalypse, Logan and Gambit. And that was when they were trying, you know, for years they were trying to do a, a Channing Tatum Gambit movie and it could just never get off the ground. I think now now that we've seen him here. I think he's too famous for it. Like, does that make sense? Like, I think that Channing Tatum no, as a, Gambit. No, that's exactly perfect. That's exactly the point I was trying to make earlier. Yeah, he's just his face is too recognizable. It doesn't fit the mold anymore for Gambit. I'm not gonna as he's a little too old at this point to play Gambit. I'm really too established right now to play Gambit because, like I said, yeah. Gambit's not a main leading role. But when he's in it, it's fun. And Channing Tatum really has a lot of fun and really shows us the potential of that film that could have came out. Long time ago, he was just a baby face back then now, you know? And so, um, yeah, I can't believe it. This is all the farewell to the Fox stuff, which is ironic, though, because there is a line that Wesley Snipes says as Blade, where he's the, he's like, I'm the only Blade. And so that's very interesting that they let him say that because they could utilize him again. And who knows what's going on with this new Blade movie? That's well, he says it, and then immediately Deadpool gives like an aside to the camera because we all know that they're working on a new one. So I took it as like that was the joke, is you know Wesley Snipes, I'm the only Blade, but like we all know there's going to be another Blade. But I also take it as it's very true though. Like it's going to be really hard for the uh, Mahershala Ali to play. I mean, he he looks the part. He's a great actor, and it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be hard to swallow, though, seeing no more Wesley Snipes' Blade, but I would love to see him in the franchise in some capacity. Like, it'd be a shame to not have him in the MCU as anything else, and they could definitely do that, obviously, with the variant stuff and, you know, the tons you can do now with all this multiverse stuff. But uh, that was good. That was a great line because it really was a strong one because that's true. There is no other Blade right now, and we don't know when the next Blade's going to be, just like Wolverine. We don't know when the next... Wolverine's going to be, it's Hugh Jackman right now. And, and Kevin Feige said, for now, Jackman is the MCU Wolverine until that changes, until he gets too old. Oh, speaking of, remember the really old man, Clint Eastwood, Hugh Jackman look. Did you, uh, oh, Wolverine they did look. do an old, a really, really like old. a really classic look of old man Logan. Like really, yeah, it's like really spot on. 
which uh, which was a great look as well. But the MCU is going to look different after this movie. And as in, a lot of stuff is being brought over. I thought they were going to reset but everything. Is it bring... though? That's my thing though. Is it going to be different? I, I guess that's where I'm confused. Well, you didn't feel, did you feel like this is really an MCU film like that we've been used to the last so many years? I mean, this felt like something fresh, different. It's a rated R film, first of all. So now we know what they can do with the rated R feature film. So you're, you're talking more big picture of what they can bring in as far as like now they've done rated R movies and now they've kind of introduced new themes and tactics. Yeah, I OK, I see what you're saying there. I was going to say from a story standpoint, like I know we haven't finished go kind of going through everything, but nothing in this movie takes place in the MCU proper, with the exception of the scene where he meets with Happy Hogan. Right. right. And and wants to be part but of the that's Avengers. a good thing, though, the fact that it is a big story and, and the fact that you can have it such a. In a different world and it's isolated, it feels big. I don't feel like I was cheated out of anything. You know, this was worth every admission, like every dollar of admission and more. And that's some of the problems I had with other films that had like bigger instances with the multiverse and the MCU. And I expected so much from that. And I was like, oh, this is just a waste of time. This really didn't catapult the story per se. It's, it's still a standalone movie, but it felt strong because it brought in so many different characters at the same time. And it's like, look what you can do with a, still an isolated story. It's still an isolated story. And it's really focused on Deadpool per se. And um, look how much fun you can have. Like, that's the thing. And I think that's where Multiverse of Madness cheaped out because it was supposed to be a really strong story that really catapulted the multiverse stuff, but it didn't give us anything like this. And this is not a multiverse story per se. It's not really trying to be like, this is going to happen in Earth 616. This is the effects it has on 616 and so forth. But now the MCU can be like, we don't have to connect every single thing and we can drag things and not explain it too much. And people can still have fun. I didn't scratch my head, be like, this is impossible. You can't do this. This oh, doesn't make definitely any sense. Not. This no. is the one that blows up the MCU and said, anything is possible now. Like anything. And we revisited the Fox saga stuff, like, and brought that in. So be ready for anything we throw your way. Just like Fantastic Four is not going to be Earth 616. It's placed in the 60s on a different Earth, and we'll see how it works. Maybe they won't come to earth 616 and they'll be communicate the avengers will be communicating with them from a different you know aspect and saying hey galactus is coming i'm just making stuff up i don't know anything but i'm just saying now you don't have to really real rely on 616 films and this showed you you didn't have to do that and that's what i loved about it where i care now about these characters and they're, on, they're not even the main mcu and that's what's so brilliant about it and uh so I think for me, and I know we, I mean, we what's really left, right? There's the big fight. You, you kind of see the end of, of Cassandra Nova. Well, ish, you know, you got to go back to the TVA, you kind of bring things full circle. There's a big fight scene with like a bunch of Deadpool variants. Oh, right? and a bunch of like, that was kind of cool too. I loved it. And the lady Deadpool, for those that were expecting Taylor Swift, it's not Taylor Swift. It's his wife, Blake Lively doing the voice. And, and I was uh, looking, there's a few other voices apparently here that I didn't know these when I was watching the movie because I didn't know. But apparently Matthew McConaughey was the cowboy Deadpool, which yes, I, didn't know. I did. Sound, it did sound like him. I was trying to figure that one out, um, which is awesome. Like the voice of everyone that's a Deadpool variant is not the actor in the suit, obviously, uh, especially Blake Lively. I don't think she was in the suit at all. They just had right. someone to and do Nathan that. And Nathan Fillion is Headpool, the floating head. Um so, yeah, like these were things I didn't know who they were, you know, because they're all in masks and uh, it's just some voices. But but that's a fun fight scene. First of all, that that was a lot of fun, too, at the end of the day. And what he does with I mean, Doc Pool's right there. Doc Pool is with them. And then you have Highlander <laughs> Deadpool, which is used as like a bullet. That was good. Vest. That was good. And he's the one Deadpool that doesn't have the regenerating power like yes. that. That was funny. You have Kid Pool. Um, you have baby pool you have everything there and then there's also not a very sweet cameo if you hopefully no one misses of stanley on the side of that bus there is his photo there and i forget what it was showing but there's a stanley cameo he's on the side of the bus that they're all battling on which was really great to i was waiting for that to see and um yeah it's great that they include stanley still in some capacity I did like talking about the Cassandra Nova stuff. I did like her putting her hand through people's faces and like oh, yes. the fingers moving up and down the hand I, along their faces. I liked that visual. And 
a lot of times, you know, when you get to the end climaxes of these Marvel movies, like sometimes they're just kind of a lot of mumbo jumbo. And this one, you know, she's just destroying a machine and and Deadpool and Wolverine come together to stop it. Um, however, that scene between Deadpool and Wolverine and Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds, I thought was really good. And there's they they bring comedy into it because there's a joke about like basically how good a shape Hugh Jackman's in. <laughs> like they really focus on his abs and how good they look. I mean, come on, guy. we gotta give him props. Like that is an impressive build. Like good for him, especially at that age, you know. And really, I couldn't tell you how old. He, like I know how old he's now, but I'm saying he doesn't look his age or even close to it. And this is the Wolverine I remember from the beginning. Like it, it's it's wild, and that's why it, he's got such great work ethic and really takes this character seriously um, from the down up and everything like that, you know? So yeah, crazy build for him. And he, that's hard he, to keep he looked up. incredible. And, and I actually kind of liked this moment as like a bonding moment between the two characters. So what could have been just a total throwaway, I thought there was some fun there. And then this is where you kind of get into the true wrap up of the movie, which is what you were kind of alluding to and, and talking about the MCU moving forward. I think what I was the most surprised with here was that I really thought they were going to tie it up with a pretty bow and be like, OK, Deadpool, here you are. You were now in the MCU. You were here on Earth 616. It is clear this is where you are and everything else is aside or Hugh Jackman's Wolverine goes his own way. And really, it doesn't end that way. Like they save their, their world. They're both in like. Deadpool's old world, but he now has ties to the MCU because of, you know, the TVA and wanting to be there. I was surprised that it didn't leave him like in the, our current MCU present. That surprised me. It left it a little bit more open ended than but I expected. It's possible because Happy Hogan says, We'll keep an eye out on you. And I wonder if he knows he's not from that Earth, which I'm very curious about because he's using his cable teleporta uh, teleporting device to get there. And so, like, that's kind of another plot point that we can probably revisit later and probably will come to do with Secret Wars, maybe, where he's like, All of a sudden, like, Oh, I got this. Someone beat me and I have to be somewhere and he just teleports somewhere. He probably like in the middle of secret wars happening. He just pops in and is like, oh, I got the call to come, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah, does something. like it's that's that's what I imagine. He surely he'll show up in the future Avengers movies, but it'll be like the TVA grabs him, brings him over to help with something. And then he's mad. He gets sent back or something. I don't know. Yeah, because he's uh, back in his own world and stays there. And this Wolverine stays with him there. And uh, which is very interesting. Uh, there was one point I wanted to make, but I totally forgot what it was, but it's something I feel like we missed. Uh, I'll probably get back to it whenever I can. But uh, yeah, the back to, oh, Peter, the Peter aspect of it. That oh, yeah. was <laughs> <laughs> Peter's Peter. I'm going to say it like that too. <laughs> you in that, in that Deadpool suit, you see a lot of Peter's Peter in there. Uh, and yes, you do. And, <laughs> I love Rob Delaney. I think he's very funny. It was really funny. And that's a big plot point with the Deadpool battle and how it all stopped because they defeated all of them and they all came back and all of a sudden here comes Peter and, and he's like, Oh, it's Peter. And Peter saves the day. He's like, this is my Deadpool, uh, which is really great. And, you know, obviously in the beginning we have the main, the main core Deadpool cast there and, and all that stuff. So uh, it's been interesting because no one's technically killed off. Everyone's still existing. Oh, I, that world, that Earth 1005 is still around. It's been saved, right? I guess is what happens. So it does. I still scratch my head as what's the future going to look like per se, and, but we just got to be patient. This one really just showed us Marvel has a way of making these movies and adding all these characters in, in a crazy way that really shouldn't make sense, but it does make sense at the end of the day. The TVA is involved. Going forward, the TVA will be involved. We'll see who else is involved in mixing and matching all these characters that we're seeing. And it's a new era. It really is. I, you know, you said it, it's not that a big movie and effect on the MCU, but on a, on a, a point of the multiverse stuff and what's capable for just the film, bringing all these big names together. It's like, a, it's a reset button. Be like, forget everything you remember in the past. We're just going to make these wild movies and you're just going to love them. And I felt like that was with this. I think that's true to an extent. I think that it'll be a while till we really see that because, you know, I saw a trailer for Captain America Brave New World right before this, and that looks like 
just the most traditional Captain America movie you could have, except with Sam Wilson as Captain America. Like I know it's that a Winter Red Soldier. Hulk it's and, like Winter Soldier 2.0, which was a, yeah. which a great film. And that's what they're, I guess they're trying to do. I'm, I'm interested in that movie because I think there's, you know, like just the Red Hulk of it all and, and what they're doing. And I know the leader is supposed to be in it. And, you know, there, there's a lot of things that I think are interesting, but from a trailer standpoint, that movie looks like, pretty vanilla you know straightforward marvel fair um I, it might not be but i know that there's still a lot more to come where they have a lot more freedom and flexibility so i think you're right but i don't think it's going to be something like now every mcu movie moving forward are going to be just totally wild like i think we still have to kind of get there oh no we'll get those grounded ones for sure and i think that's what they learned not every film needs to push the mcu forward in a in a crazy direction because everyone was thinking Doctor Strange was going to do that and it failed to do that. It was almost like a grounded version of what it, it was more grounded than it should have been, which was wild and it had really no effect. So now you have these gra grounded films that they'll be introducing. Thunderbolts will be the same way. It's like almost like a ground level that Spider-Man 4 is going to be probably more grounded too, which is great and not worry about the other effects. Once we get into another, I guess, Doctor Strange film, the Avenger stuff, uh, Shang Chi. If they do another one, there'll be more of the magical elements, more of the multiverse stuff. Uh, I really think the what happens with Fantastic Four will give us a better understanding where this is going to lead us because that's truly the first. I don't know how to explain it. the The first real Fox character movie, other than Deadpool and Wolverine, because that was really a. It's a the Fantastic Four are a big deal in the comics. And so I'm, I'm with you. I'm like of all the upcoming MCU movies, I think Fantastic Four is the one I'm most excited for and the most interested in. And we're talking about this on the cusp of San Diego Comic Con full steam had Deadpool and Wolverine hit theaters tonight. Uh, they had a screening at, I think, San Diego Comic Con with obviously Sean Levy and uh, Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman. There's a panel for Marvel. They have to announce some things. Fantastic Four starts filming um, end of this month. They're at San Diego Comic Con, so we'll see some stuff there. On top of that, you have D23. So I think Kevin Feige just put a soft reset of what he was planning on doing. Remember the Kang situation? They're going to be maybe announcing... I don't think they're going to announce a recast. It's just going to happen. Might change things. They will have the Russo brothers are looking at directing the, both those Avengers films, which I think is really brilliant because you really need to have someone that can manage what there's, what's going on with the Avengers. And there, I mean, there's just so much going on. And so there that's has to like be a, a classic fiber. example of needing each other, right? Like the Russo's post Marvel career has been not where they wanted it to be. Marvel, you know, wants a sure bet for for their Avengers movies. I personally love it because they know how to make an Avengers movie. So I'm I'm here for it. Yeah, I'm trying to see uh, what I can find, you know, um, what they consider phase five was Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, then Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. I mean, uh, you got the Marvels, Deadpool, Wolverine, then Captain America, Brave New World, and then Thunderbolts. And apparently, I think that's the end for the films. And then you should go into um, maybe the Secret Wars, if that's the case. But I don't think so. Everything's getting pushed back right now for many reasons. Uh, due to the strike and other situations going on. And then you have Agatha all along. Um, I can't think of anything else that's going on other than the what if stuff. Um, I'm just trying to find like a up. They're they're going to have to update their phases on what to expect because it's a little it's a little you have Ironheart at the same time as well. Uh, so there's a lot going on. We're gonna get Daredevil TV show wise, and so they just gotta rebalance everything out. Have you found something that's gonna kind of tell us what's going on um, with the phases? Because I'm looking at what I see, and we're almost done with Phase Five. It seems like we're halfway through it, or more than that. Yeah, it looks like just. Captain America and Thunderbolts round out phase five, but then Fantastic Four and Blade are supposed to be the first movies of phase six, which, you know, Captain America coming out in February, we're already getting trailers for that. Thunderbolts comes out in May. So, I'm, you know, I'm assuming uh, come, you know, Super Bowl time and then the lead up to Captain America, we'll start seeing trailers for Thunderbolts. Fantastic Four is supposedly slated to come out in July of next year, which I know they're going into production of it this July, so they could have it done by then. But that seems like a very fast turnaround. They're filming, I think, in London over there, and it just depends on the story they have going on. And if you, what we're teased, it's going to be a really 
retro futuristic look and um i have faith in them actually i think unless they're at santa comic con to obviously maybe give a new date but i don't see that happening i really hope not i'm tired of the push the pushing back release dates and so forth but you know um Fantastic Four is going to lead into a lot of stuff. That's really the next big thing for them. You know, that should lead into yep. the next two Avenger films and and so forth. But, you know, uh, I got to say that, I mean, this was really a bold film just because it's like we're bringing back Fox stuff and we're going to give you another Fox type movie full blown. So I, I give props and the Kevin Feige and Marvel Studios and really cool to see my reaction making top of the headlines across the world. Uh, start off with Variety front and center a lot of youtube channels are just going over my reaction and so forth i don't know how that happened but i very thankful of uh, my reaction making its way to almost every single major publication around the world and uh just showing my excitement i have for this film i mean it's deadpool and wolverine it's a winning combination regardless of what you think and if i had to rank them i'll be honest this is a true authentic ranking of the deadpools one Deadpool, Wolverine, and then two. I put two last. Uh, I know a lot of people love two, um, but I felt like this. You this put is one at the top as the, the number. Your first. Oh, interesting. Yeah, surprisingly, yes. My because, order is actually probably the exact inverse of yours. I think I go Deadpool two, Deadpool and Wolverine, then Deadpool. Okay, see, so you're one of those that has the second Deadpool as a higher thing. I. I have some and issues I have friends it. that love Deadpool 2. I don't love it. I, I'm like, I think the first Deadpool is fine. And I thought the second Deadpool was like a little better than fine. And I, and I think this one's probably about there too. But my thing is coming full circle. When you asked me at the top of the show, I feel the same way about this that I felt about Spider-Man No Way Home. I liked No Way Home better than this, actually, uh, personally. But Spider-Man No Way Home, I did not get to see it in a full theater. I saw it like a daytime showing. There were only a few people there. And when you're watching a big fan service movie in that way, a movie that's supposed to be like seen with a packed theater, the reactions to that movie were very muted. And I felt like, oh, this movie is almost designed for fan reaction. So if you don't get that, it like doesn't operate the same way. And I feel like Deadpool and Wolverine is actually a little bit more cohesive than that. Like, I don't feel like you need the crowd as much, but it's still doing a lot of fan servicey stuff where I'm like, it's is that in lieu of this being like a good movie, though? And I, I'm not saying this is a bad movie because I think it's a good movie, but it like it almost takes the fan service and the cameos and everything take precedence over like if the story itself is actually pretty good. Luckily you have Hugh Jackman who's incredible and Ryan Reynolds who had like, they have great chemistry together and the bond and the naming of this movie is Deadpool and Wolverine works because the two characters have well, chemistry. It was Deadpool they work and, well together. It was Deadpool and friend. And then it got leaked and they changed it before Super Bowl to Deadpool and Wolverine. But I'll say this, when you mentioned Spider-Man for me, this it's, it's completely different because Spider-Man movies are supposed to have a lot of heart and emotion and that's what i feel when i get that's what i get from it what i get from deadpool movies is a ton of excitement as an adult at the same time you know as because it's tailored to a mature audience with the vulgarity and the language so it's like it really is a different purpose these types of films and so it's really hard i love the spider-man films i love no way home i just feel like they have a different purpose and what they're trying to evoke where this is really, you know, pays a, a homage to the characters and from the Fox and really ties it up. And it's really cool and in a crazy way. And I don't think Deadpool movies really are crafted to have the best story because it's Deadpool and Deadpool really shouldn't have that big of effect on, on the MCU as a whole in general. And, you know, this was a grand story that felt very pocket like, you know, in small space, which worked. And I like that. You know, it's just put Deadpool out there, but don't let him be able to affect too, too much. Because then, you know, Deadpool, he's crazy. He could go mess up a lot of stuff, just like he did with, with Cable's thing. You know, he you don't want to give him too much power. Give Spider-Man all the power over the responsibility, you know. Deadpool cannot handle that. Deadpool will mess things up, and I think that was the case. You don't want him. He doesn't have a good conscience. He doesn't do things for the better. You know, his whole reasoning in this film is he wanted to be Avenger just to keep his girlfriend around. That's a horrible reason to be a superhero. So his purpose as a hero doesn't make sense. Um, 
but that's just not my two cents. It's a, it's a really good point, though. It, it, it's not like they tied up this movie with Ryan Reynolds is now the face of the MCU. Like, it's not. Yes, that. He, yes he, he is. He said it. He's Marvel Jesus. <laughs> he's, he's Marvel, Marvel Jesus. Jesus. He, is the, he is the face. He is the bridge between what we loved, the beginning of Marvel, right? He's like the transition of the beginning of Fox, uh, Marvel films, and just he's bridging it. And that's a brilliant way to bridge those two because they realize like Hugh Jackman's Wolverine is the Wolverine they want in the MCU for now. Yeah. And I think that's the way to do it. And a couple other characters. We'll see whoever who else they bring over. That's that's for sure. Uh, the only thing I'd say though to counter that is the so in lieu of a traditional mid credit scene in this movie, it's a it's like a eulogy to the Fox Marvel universe set to uh, Green Day, Time of Your Life. And it's like showing behind the scenes from the X-Men movie from 2000 and showing a baby-faced Ryan Reynolds doing interviews from when he was filming Wolverine Origins, where he's so much more like properly media trained because he's young trying to make a name for himself. And he's like, oh, I've just always loved the character and identified th with the character and always wanted to play this role. And like now we, you know, we know who Ryan Reynolds is a lot more. Um, I loved all that. I like that was the thing. I was like, even though you're seeing behind the scenes from like that Fantastic Four movie from 2015 that is kind of notoriously hated by many and you're seeing um, behind the scenes from movies as recent as the Dark Phoenix movie they did and, and some that weren't necessarily received as well. I was like, oh, this is making me feel something because these are movies I grew up with that I, you know, watched over the past 25 years that I that I really loved. And so I thought that was still like, even though not all the movies that Fox did and with their Marvel properties were good there's still a lot of nostalgic and it's nostalgia and emotion tied to them. And I was just thinking like Sony could never other than the Spider-Man movies. Like, you know, do you think one day we're going to be getting a, a like a, <laughs> a montage eulogy to Morbius and Venom and Craven? Like, no, probably not. <laughs> no. And that's because, you know, this is really, you know, this is the, the, the children growing up. Like this is, that's what this was showing is showing the ch your, your children growing up in those montages and stuff. And the beginning of Kevin Feige's journey. And this is what I also think it me means the most. And that's why it's very heartfelt at the same time is it's really about Kevin Feige, to be honest. I want to just, I want to put a light on Kevin Feige because he was there for the original X-Men. He was there for Blade in a different capacity. He was not the Kevin Feige we know today, but it's because of him, his experience he picked up and his brilliant brain. If you go on Neutropolis.com, we have the video from the Hollywood Walk of Fame and this is speeches and stuff in his journey. And that's what it is like small beginnings and look where it is now. And yeah, not everything worked out perfectly with the Fox stuff, but they were there and they're part of our, our childhood or us being younger. I don't, we weren't children per se when those came out. Uh, at least uh, some of the law stuff came out when we were teenagers and in college. And so, you know, it was just great to see that close, the, close that chapter and bring whatever you want to bring over with you. That's going to work. And let, let's see what they're going to be cooking next. And that's all because of Kevin Feige. So I have to give him a lot of credit. And I'm so glad that I got to meet him in person and, and tell him thank you. Um, the troubles couldn't exist because of him. And it's the same thing like what happened with the first Iron Man and what that really evoked on all of us and how that really regenerate, you know, put life back into comic book movies and really elevated them. And so now you can have a little fun. And yeah, it's just exciting. Like, goodbye, Fox. Hello to this new MCU that's going to now understand like they made some mistakes also with the mcu that's what this movie pokes one of the last few movies some of them were hit or misses and didn't really do anything for us but i think now everyone has put a soft reset kevin feige as well and knows what they want to do pushing forward because also real quick captain america brave new world they did some reshoots they're trying to do some things maybe hopefully make it a little bit better and now with fantastic four make things a little bit better agatha all along we'll see what that does better I mean, Thunderbolts, I think they did some additions as well. And so they're really making sure, um, especially with Bob, Bob Iger returning, I think he had probably had a conversation with Feige, like, hey, let's put a little bit more money in if needed and do a couple of things and make it firmer and go back to the glory days of the MCU. But, yeah, I'm, I mean, yeah. I'm just, I'm excited to get back to a place where we're we're getting Marvel movies more consistently throughout the year and I'm excited to go see them. And that's how I feel like this has given us a break. This movie was very fun. We're not going to get another one until February. 
of the MCU proper. I mean, I'm you know, sorry, Venom fans. I'm not I'm not discounting that we get a new Venom movie this year <laughs> or a new Joker movie for that matter. But um, <laughs> no, but I mean, like we're going to get back on track. It's going to be it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I, and, and San Diego Comic Con is about to happen. I'm sure we're going to get a lot more news. We might see a new Spider-Man movie put on the schedule. We might see some things that we're like, oh, OK, that's what they're doing next. So we we might have more insight here soon and we might have some things to really get excited about. And I'm sure we'll talk about them on the show. Yep, that was a road bump that Marvel went through. And I feel like now we're just over that road, that road bump and we're going to get some really great stuff. Thank you all, everyone, for tuning in to episode 50. I mean, this is exciting, Drew, that we get to you know, duo with Deadpool and Wolverine with us. I mean, this was a jam packed episode. We got to talk about a lot. Yeah, no, it was. And you know, it's probably it's, it's after midnight guys are doing this so we can get this out to y'all. Uh, but don't forget to subscribe and share all the Nertropolis content coming your way. You know, if you saw Deadpool Wolverine, leave a comment below. Tell us your, I mean, it's a spoiler video. So sure. If you put a spoiler in comments, it is what it is. Uh, our headline, our title, I definitely have spoilers in the title, but uh, start a conversation with us on social media, on our YouTube channel. Uh, we're excited for the MCU, as you can tell. But once again, Drew, where, th- where can they find you? You can find me at Drew Munhausen on all the different social media platforms, logging movies every day over at Letterboxd. And of course, here with Sean. Cheers to another 50 episodes. Cheers to 100 more episodes of Movie Goer Society, where you can find us every week talking about all the newest movies are out in theaters or on streaming. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Movie Guard Society. Once again, I'm Sean Toshberg, the mayor of Metropolis, and we will see you at the movies.